interlude going right now. morning. Take your Bibles and open to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 7. We're going to continue talking about spiritual liberty today. Last week we looked at spiritual liberty as Paul showed us that we were buried with Christ and risen with Christ through salvation uh, pictured in baptism. And that because of that, we have a new life. We are dead to sin. We are living with Christ if we have trusted Christ as our Savior. And he brought out the fact that the things that we did before salvation were shameful. We can't even really speak of them without shame. And he, and he asks us then, why would we go back to that? If we have trusted Christ and we are dead to sin, why would we go back to that kind of life as believers? We're not going to increase grace. We're not going to make God love us more or, or get some extra benefit by trying to live in sin. In fact, he uses one of the strongest uh, phrasings in Greek where he says, God forbid, uh, this like saying, no, absolutely not. Don't do this. And so as he's teaching through this, he, we now get to seven, and Paul kind of elaborates on this dead to the law thing. In chapter seven, he says, beginning in verse one, he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if her husband be dead, if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that, the, so that she is no adulteress, though she was married to another man. So what he wants us to understand is while we're alive, the law is in effect. Correct? And we talked about this the last Sunday or the Sunday before about, you know, speeding and, and the policeman pulls you over and writes you a ticket. Or if you decide you're going to try to run from him, you wreck your car and kill yourself, he can write all the tickets he wants. It means nothing because you're dead. You're no longer bound by the law because you're dead. And it's important that we understand the law is active until one of two things happens. Either we die or the law is actually fulfilled. When the law is fulfilled, it's done. Correct? This is uh-huh, this is uh-uh. Okay, just want to make sure you're still alive here. Um, so a person who dies, the law can do nothing more. The law is fulfilled. It has no more purpose. So that's what we're looking at. So he gives the example of a wife being married and her husband dies. Now we know, according to Scripture, marriage was intended one man, one woman, one lifetime. And the only exception to that was a husband or a spouse or wife that passes away, then the law is fulfilled and the, and the remaining is, is, is able, wow, could be a long day, to go on and marry another. And that is legitimate. It has, they have fulfilled the law because the law says you're married until death parts you. Now, I know we have teachings uh, amongst our brethren and, and different groups that teach that if you have had a torturous marriage and you divorced and that person's still alive, then if you marry again, you're living in adultery. That, there's a problem with that in that God can't forgive. I have a problem with that. If the, if the couple has, they've gone their way, they've repented, they've gotten right with God, they've, they've done what they're supposed to do, there is forgiveness in Christ. So if you have been through the, the horror of having to go through a previous marriage. And listen, we like to try to hang on pieces part sometimes, and, and I don't know why God is making me stay here for a minute, but we hang on pieces parts where Jesus said, except for the cause of fornication, in other words, adultery, there, there's no provision for, for um, divorce. You know, we don't have every single thing that's ever been said, spoken, written, and every single little yes, no in, in Scripture. 
we are given principles, we're given direction, we're given character of God, we're given his overall, and we are supposed to actually use our brains in this and realize this is what God's motives are, this is God's heart. Because if we stand firm on that, we become dogmatic on that. And listen, I'm not, I'm not saying divorce is good or okay. I'm saying it's not. That was not God's intention. In fact, Jesus said God gave, you, gave Moses the writing of divorcement because of a hard heart. But if this is the only reason, then we're having to tell people, okay, especially ladies, if you're in a relationship where your husband's beating you, if he's not cheating on you, you've got to stay there and just get beat until he kills you. Does that fit with the character of God? Does that fit with the nature of God? It can't. And then we really get in trouble when we get over into Romans, or I mean into 1 Corinthians, and Paul is talking about these folks that have been married, you know, 10, 15, 20 times. That was their custom. And they're talking about, well, what if I've trusted Christ and my spouse doesn't? And they say, what if my spouse leaves? What do I do? He says, if they don't want Christ, they don't want to live with you in Christ, let them go. So Paul just violated scripture, right? He couldn't have because Paul was speaking under inspiration of God. So we need to be careful about where we're dogmatic. When God is dogmatic, we need to be dogmatic. When God is not dogmatic, we need to be sure that we are not because we just make ourselves a fool and we hurt people who have come through trauma, who come through difficulties. Not everybody marries the love of their life, and they serve God together, and they live until one or both die. Some people end up in terrible situations that cannot work out, will not work out, and they have to part company. If God can't forgive that, I'm just going to have to say as, lovely as, I, as lovingly as I can, um, like Moses said, if you can't forgive these folks, you're not my God. God is a forgiving God. God can own, there's only one sin God cannot forgive. One, one and one only, and that is rejection of his son. So he gives us this, this example of marriage because this is supposed to be the closest, most dynamic, and most permanent relationship in a human life. And he says, hey, listen, we know that if this woman leaves her husband, goes marry somebody else, she's living as an adulteress. If there was no legitimate law, no legitimate reason, there was nothing that, that fall, fell within Scripture for her to leave or him to leave, then they are living in sin. But if her husband dies, she's free to go marry another because the law has no more effect. The law has been fulfilled. The Bible says one woman, one man, one lifetime. One lifetime has been completed in the part of the man. And he's dead, so the law doesn't do anything to him anyway. She's free to go marry another. So... You think, okay, so why are we doing all this? Because there's a big, big picture he wants to give here. In verse 4, he continues on saying, Wherefore, my brethren, just like this, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we are dead to the law when we trust Christ. Because the Bible says that the moment we trust Christ, we are immersed into his blood. And in doing so, we are immersed into his death. And just as he was raised from the dead, we are raised from the dead, both spiritually now and physically in the future. Don't you like that? This body's going to quit someday, but me, the real me, it never going to quit. I will just transfer from here to heaven in an instant. I love the picture of Stephen standing there stoning him, and he sees heaven open and the Lord standing at the right hand to welcome him home. Before his body dies, Stephen left this world, and I think that is true of all believers. He said that we will not taste death. We will be translated. There is no, and I know we teach it, we're trying to, trying to make it simple. We say, it's just like closing your eyes here and you're opening your eyes there. No. I say that when you approach that moment of death, all that happens is your vision changes to be able to see heaven. And you get from here to there. 
what was it Dr. Wellington called? The happy hop from here to hallelujah. We will see the heavens open, and we will see the Father, we will see the Son, we'll be ushered to His throne, and our bodies will die sometime after that. Many of us have been at the side of people who have died and watched this take place, knew they were gone, but their body was still going. We will not die. That's the whole premise of John 3.16, is it not? That God so loved the world that He gave His only born Son, His only begotten Son, that whosoever, and that's you and me, whosoever believes in Him will not, shall not perish, but have present tense everlasting life. We have everlasting life. And because we've trusted Christ, Spiritually, we have died with Him, been buried with Him, and been risen with Him. And the law is dead to us, or we are dead to the law. So keeping with our subject, notice the marriage example that he uses. And this is not, this is not new. He says that we should be married to another. We're dead to the law, married to Christ. And this is seen throughout. Let me give you just a couple of quick references. Ephesians chapter 5. When he's talking to the husbands, in verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man yet ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, they too shall be one flesh. Now notice what Paul says right here. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So even here where Paul is actually teaching on a marital relationship, he takes his pause, he says, I know this is crazy, but I'm actually speaking about the church here. Marriage is actually a picture of the church. The church is a picture of marriage. You know, we can't truly understand and grasp the depth of what it means to be one with Christ until we are married Till we can understand what it is to be one with another human, can we begin to grasp a little bit about what it is to be one in Christ? And I know some of you are thinking, you can't tie those together. Have you read Solomon? The Song of Solomon? You need to sometime. It's a young people, you don't. Older people, you do. It's a very graphic book. When you come to that in FBI, you'll notice that Not very far into the lecture, John will say, if you have young people in the room, this would probably be a good time for them to step out. And then he'll go a little bit and he'll say, if there's anybody left in the room, they really need to be gone. And then he gets to a certain point and goes, you really need to make sure nobody can hear what's coming. If they're not married, if they're not old enough to handle this, they need to be out of the room. Because it's a very graphic book about the intimacy of marriage. And what you find is you start with a Shulamite talking, and she's bragging about her husband in very sensual ways. And then suddenly Solomon is talking about his bride in very sensual ways. And in the middle of reading that, suddenly God is talking. (laughs) Yes! And I will say to us couples, you want to experience the fullness of Christ in your marriage? Get together with Jesus. Together with Jesus. You you will have some strange experiences. You will be in the midst of prayer, a time of intensity together, and you will find that God turns that into something much different than what you intended for it to start. And at first, if you've never been through it, you'll think, I I can't be thinking like this because I'm, I'm here in prayer and I can't be. God created that part of the marriage. Hebrews says that marriage is honorable above all and the bedroom is not defiled. Most marriages, they get the emotional, they get the physical, they rarely get the spiritual. I'm telling you, if you want a marriage that will, that will light your days and make fire in your night, you get close to Jesus together and watch what he does. And don't be afraid of it because God created it, God blesses it, God will start it. You let him do what he wants to do. And so he gives us pictures of marriage to help us understand how we are supposed to be with him. But 
beyond just the picture of the marriage itself, look at how James equates disobedience in spiritual black, backsliding or fleshly living. In, uh, in James chapter 4, beginning of verse 1, he says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust, and ye have not. Ye kill, ye desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight, and ye war, ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace? Wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Notice what he says. He says, those who lust out of this flesh, who draw back to the sin of this world, who get into this world's way of thinking, these are Christians he's talking to. And he calls them adulterers and adulteresses. He says, following the flesh is called friendship with the world. We said, now listen, I'm a Christian. I just, you phrase it how you want to. The Bible says that friendship with the world, backsliding, living this world's ideas, this world's way, living in this world's means and ways of doing things, that is enmity with God. That word literally means an enemy. Following the world is considered enmity with God. Following the world, living like the world, makes us an enemy of God. You see, but Brother Mac, I'm a Christian. I can't be the enemy of God. I don't know if you're a Christian or not. Only you can answer that. If you have trusted in Christ, you are a child of God. And if you're living like this world, you are the enemy of God, period. That's what the Bible says. How can I be the enemy of God if I'm one of his children? Because we're living in disobedience. We're choosing not to conduct ourselves the way this book says. We forget that this is actually a serious part of this. We have gone to, to such extremes with this. We've got, we've got churches who have gone into legalism. They've got a whole set of laws you've got to do instead of just living by the Bible. I mean, you've got to cut your hair just right if you're a man, and you've got to wear your hair just right if you're a girl, and you've got to wear just this kind of clothes if you're a guy or a guy, and you can only do this and you can only do that. None of that is in Scripture. The Bible says make sure that you can tell that you're a man, make sure that you can tell that you're a woman, dress modestly. But we make a whole bunch of rules. You, you can't come to church dressed in blue jeans. You can't come to church dressed. You can't come to church and you can't do this. You can't. How about let's go back to this. Did the Bible say any of that? No. The Bible said dress modestly. Conduct yourself appropriately. Live like you belong to God. Act like you belong to God. Live and conduct yourself like someone who has been changed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And you guard your tongue, you guard your, your tone, you guard your eyes, you guard your hands, your feet, your body. You live differently than the world lives. We are to be a testimony of the changing power of God. How many of us actually do that? We tend to do the same thing everybody else does. We talk the way they talk. We act the way they act. We sweat over the things they sweat over. We panic over the things they panic over. And we tell the same kind of jokes. We watch the same kind of shows. We go everywhere they go. And we say, you need to be saved. And they say, why? Because it'll change your life. Hadn't changed yours. And isn't it amazing how the lost always know how a Christian is supposed to act? And the saved can't seem to figure it out. Now, we're not going to belabor it. We spoke last time about Paul when he mentioned that all things to me are lawful, but not all things are expedient. There are some things that, that are not unlawful for us to do, but weaker brothers can't understand it. They don't know it yet. Our job is to teach them, not to offend them, not to, not to bring them down. But there should be something different. The Bible says that when we trust Christ, we're no longer ourselves. We've been bought with a price. And it tells us that the old man has passed away and all things have become new. So the way we think should be new. The way we act should be new. Where we go, what we do, all of that should change. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever talk to somebody. You see somebody who is a, who is a sinner. 
I, I listened to a pastor one time preaching on biblical separation. He said, he said, listen, some of y'all are just a, t- a touch too separated. He said, you say, sinner, I don't, I don't even know what one of those look like. He said, and that's the problem. You don't know what one of those look like. You haven't looked in the mirror and you haven't realized you're here to reach those people. We throw up all these walls, all these barricades. We throw up all sorts of things in legalism, and yet we don't get down to where Jesus was. You know, do you remember what Jesus was accused of? Eating with publicans and sinners. You know what Jesus wasn't accused of? Acting like a publican and a sinner. He was called rabbi, prophet, teacher. Now, those that hated him, they, they tried everything, but nothing could stick because he lived differently. Even when they tried to trap him in taxes. Should we pay taxes unto Caesar? He said, hey, bring, give me a coin. Whose picture's on that? I said, Caesar said, then give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to God what is God's. We need to wake up and understand we live in this world. We're not to be part of this world. We're supposed to live in this world, and we're supposed to live Jesus in this world so people can see there's a better world to coming. And we're supposed to get this idea that we are dead to the law. And if we're dead in that marriage, we should be in another marriage with Jesus Christ and one we protect. Let me ask you something. Wives, if your husband tells you, he loves you and never does anything for you. Gets up every morning, tells you he loves you, and on the way out the door, he might even say it again, I love you. But he doesn't touch you, doesn't kiss you, doesn't bring you things, doesn't, doesn't try to do things for you, doesn't take care of just, you know, little things that you can do to demonstrate your love. Do you buy it? What if your husband gets up in the morning and says, hey, I love you, but listen, I'm going to go hang out with this girl, and I'm going to be with her all this week, and then I will be back. Because I love you. I'll be back later. You ladies okay with that? How many of y'all just throw a hand up telling me that you're okay with that? How many of y'all already already thinking how many rounds are in the magazine? See, you got hands right there, and unfortunately one of them was my bride's. Do you realize this is, in essence, what we do with Christ? Jesus saved me. I am a sinner. I need you to be my Savior. And so he does. He washes us in his blood. He saves us. He, he buries us in death with him. He raises us in life with him through the power of his blood, through the power of his grace. And then we go, okay, so I love you, and I want you to save me. I want to be yours. But I'm going to go hang out with this other girl all the rest of the time. I'm going to go where I shouldn't. I'm going to go do things that dishonor you. I'm going to do things that show that I don't really love you. I'm going to speak in ways that show I don't really love you. I'm going to act in ways that show I don't really love you. But but when I come back and I need you, I expect you to take care of whatever I need. I expect you to make sure whatever goes wrong, you fix it. Is our bridegroom happy with that? He said this relationship and salvation with Christ is very much a marriage. Christ gave the most beautiful and powerful proposal ever given. He promised to lay down his life and to take it up. If we would marry him, he would protect us for eternity. That He would conquer death. He would conquer hell. We would never have any worries like that ever again if we would just say yes to him. But he did something none of us can do. He went and did it. He didn't ask us to marry him and then wait and see if anything happened, if he really could live up to it. I mean, ladies, wouldn't you be impressed if your hubby on the front end of this thing said, listen, I can conquer death and hell. If you'll marry me, I can protect you from all of that. If if something happens, if something killed me, I'd lift my life right back up. You'd be impressed with that, right? Or you think he was a psychotic idiot, run. But that's exactly what Jesus told us, is it not? But then, uh, instead of us having to get into this marriage and wait a while, see if anything happened, could he really live up to it? He did it. He went and laid down his life. No man took his life, the Bible says. He laid it down. And if he lays it down, he can pick it back up, and that's exactly what he did. Three days, he rose from the grave. He lives evermore, and there are hundreds and thousands of witnesses to his resurrection. And even to this day, I may not have seen him with these eyes, but I've seen him with these eyes. 
because he changed my life. And every one of us who's trusted Christ can say the same thing. I may not have seen him with these eyes. I may not have seen his resurrected body, but I have heard his voice, and I trusted in his voice, and he has saved me, and I am different inside than I've ever been. I love in, the, in this series, The Chosen, when Nicodemus finally finds Mary of Magdala, who's, who has been changed, and he's trying to figure out what had happened, how it happened, because he thought he had done something great. She said, there's nothing you did. It's nothing you did. I was one way, and then I was different. And the thing that happened between then and now is him, Jesus. I was one way, and now I'm different. The thing that happened is Jesus Christ. And the moment that happened, I became dead to the law. It doesn't control me anymore. It has no power over me anymore. So why would I leave my marriage? What do I find in the world that is worth sacrificing my relationship with Christ? I know I can't lose my salvation, but I can sure hurt my marriage. I can play the fool with Angie. She's not going to leave me, but I can sure hurt our relationship. I can make it so miserable we can't talk. I can make it so miserable we can't enjoy each other. We can make it so miserable. I can make it so miserable. She doesn't want to sit and hold hands with me anymore. I don't know about you, but for the last 38 years, 36 that we've been married, but for the last 38 years, I've liked holding her hand. I've liked being next to her, traveling with her. I don't want to lose that. If that is so important to us in this life, why can't we see how important that is with Jesus Christ? Why would I want to be over here when Jesus is over there? What do I gain over there? What do I get over there that is any benefit to me at all? Nothing. And if we find ourselves over there, if we find ourselves committing adultery with Jesus spiritually, you know, the rest of James right there tells us how to get back. He says in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw nigh, get close to God, he will draw an eye unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. He says, submit, be subordinate, subject yourselves unto God. We are to resist the devil. And this is an amazing thing. If we just resist the devil, he runs from us. Because if we draw nigh to God, if we submit to God and we're resisting, the, resisting Satan by drawing close to God, then Satan sees Jesus and he does what he always does. He turns tail and runs. This, all this stuff we have on TV, all this junk we've taught through all these years, and we made Satan some kind of co-equal power with Jesus, and it's a battle, and there's this raging battle. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, and God created the heavens and the earth. Period. And then he goes on to give some definition to that. Later it says he created the heavens and all that in them there is. He spoke the heavens into existence. And with that, the angels. He spoke the angels into existence. Do you really think that the God who spoke Satan into existence is going to have any real battle with Satan when he bows up. He's, he gets a third of the angels to follow him in rejection of God, and he gets kicked out of heaven. This, th this is no battle, folks. There's no, there's no oh, is it going to go down? Is he going to, is he going to make it? Just like the war, just like the battle of Armageddon, we are going to return with Christ to this earth. There's this big battle, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions of people gathered to try to do battle with God. We're going to come riding horses with swords drawn, and Jesus is just going to speak with his mouth. It's done. It's over. They're all going to disappear. We're going to go, yeah! Okay. Because whatever he says must happen. Just like when Jesus was being condemned because his followers were singing praises to him. He said, you need to tell them to shut up. He said, if they shut up, these rocks will cry out. God is going to be honored. He is going to be praised. And if we 
don't have the guts to do it, then creation itself will cry out his praises. If God says it has to be done, there's no battle with Satan. If we draw close to Christ, Satan doesn't see us. He sees Jesus. He runs like he always does. We draw nigh. We clean our hands. We purify our hearts. We humble ourselves. This is nothing new. Psalm 24, David writes, says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord, all in righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is not a new teaching for us. Honoring God, conducting ourselves in a way that is pleasing to God, is not new. So real quickly, let's read some verses. Romans 7, beginning in 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. How many of y'all used that word last week in your conversation? Concupiscence? Amen. Means vile lust. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and slew me. And by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. What is the purpose of the law? Is to reveal our sin nature. Is to reveal to us that there's nothing we can do in this flesh to earn our way to heaven. We must have a sacrifice to pay the price. The law is holy and good, but without the law, we would not understand our sin problem. This shows us how exceeding we are. And then he ends with this dilemma, and this is where we're going to end. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul describes here the nightmare of our dual nature. Our spirit has been saved by Jesus if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, but our flesh has not yet been redeemed, and it's still sinful. And it still drives us to try to do things that we know are wrong, and we constantly fight it. And Paul says, I got this battle going on. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to do what I'm supposed to with God because I got this thing going on. I got this law going on. My body is serving sin. With my heart, my mind, my spirit, I'm serving the Lord. Sadly, this is where most Christians stop. And they take great pride in saying, I have reached the place I am like Paul. Because the things I wouldn't do, those are things I do. And the things I would do, those are things I wouldn't do. And we make this some kind of break. I have made it. I am right there with Paul. But Paul didn't stop here. Paul didn't even finish this section until he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who can redeem me? Who can deliver me from this? Jesus Christ. You see, we're not meant to be here. Most Christians, it's where we're at. We delight in the things of God. We want to do those things. But we find ourselves living in the world, doing the things the world does, and we, and we try to make an excuse. Well, I'm trapped in this death, and so I just give up. Paul didn't give up. Next week, we're going to see the detail on how to get away from this. But Paul didn't give up. He didn't even end giving up. He ended by saying, who can rescue me from this nightmare? Jesus Christ. 
Folks, we are dead to the law. We no longer have to live in that. We no longer have to come up with sacrifices for everything that we've ever done. We don't have to have the heave offering and the wave offering and the, and the, and the, the once a year lamb slaughtered and, and, and then the sin offering. And we don't have to do any of that because our sacrifice, Jesus Christ, went once into the temple and offered his blood and sat down at the right hand of God making intercession forever for us. We're not bound to the law anymore. We can live, and we can live in freedom, in liberty. We don't have to give in. We don't have to do this stuff. We don't have to live in this turmoil of, I know I should do this, but I can't do it, and I shouldn't do that, and that's what I keep doing. We don't have to live there anymore. Before we were saved, we had no motivation to do that which is right. Now that we've been saved, we have the Holy Spirit of God guiding us into what's right. What we have to learn to do is quit listening to this body. Quit listening to this flesh. But we see every day all these people living like the devil, and they're making money, and they're wealthy, and they got all this stuff, and they got big houses and boats and cars, and yada, yada, yada. Great. Instead of looking at that with envy, how about we look at that what it really is? They haven't trusted Christ. This is as good as it's ever going to get. This is the best their life they can ever expect. Because the moment they leave this life, if they've not trusted Christ, they're going to see Satan face to face. And for eternity, they will live in torment. What did he get them? And now what Jesus Ask of the guy who said he's going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns and fill them up with all of his goods and he's going to sit back and take ease. He says, thou fool, for this night is thy soul required of thee, then whose will these things be? I don't remember if it was, and I may not even have the right guys. I don't know if it's Dale Carnegie or, or the guy that about went nuts before he died uh, out in California, built the spruce goose, Howard Hughes. I think it was one of those two, maybe somebody else, but I think it was one of those two that was asked one time, how much is enough? He said, just a little more. And the moment he left this life, who had all this stuff? Wasn't him. No matter what we have or we think we got to have, the moment that we leave this life, who does it belong to? Not us. It's not going with us. But what we do in this life carries. The people we lead to Christ that carries to the next life. If we've trusted Christ as our Savior, that's eternal. When we help a brother or sister grow in the Lord or help them in a time of need, that goes to reward yonder. Not only do we get benefit here from serving God, we get benefit there for serving God. We've got to get our minds out of this life, this world. There is nothing here for us. Nothing, nothing here goes to heaven with us. Nothing translates except us. And the work we do for Christ, that's all that migrates. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's nothing wrong with having cars or having a boat or a nice house. There's nothing wrong with having a nice bank account. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. Don't, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. But if that's our only goal, we're missing the mark. We're missing the greatest piece of life, and that is liberty in Christ. Now, I promise you, stuff and money and, and status and titles, none of that brings peace. None of that satisfies, and none of that carries to heaven. But when we're faithful to the Lord, when we're faithful together with our brothers and sisters in Christ to honor God, when we're taking care of the needy, when we're teaching, when we're mentoring someone, those things matter. God watches those. Do you realize that just us sitting together talking about Christ carries to eternity? You go back and read Malachi. Chapter 3. Get past the tithing part. He talks about those that sat and loved the Lord and talked about Him. The Lord heard it. and He listened. And he caused a book of remembrance to be written in his presence to be given to those who loved his name and thought of him often. 
even when we are just sitting around and we're just talking about the Lord, God's taking note. We're dead to the law. How about let's live for Christ? Let's get back in the kingdom of God. Live like we're members, like we're citizens of the kingdom. And let's keep trying to drag people into the kingdom with us. Because that's what counts. That's what lasts. It's the only way to live in freedom. Folks, if as children of God, we are living bound in this world, we are living in bondage, and it's our own making we're hanging on to. It's time to give it up. Let's move on for Jesus. Father, whatever the need is in our hearts, you know what it is more than we do ourselves. We pray that you would touch us and show us what we need, what we need to do. Father, we pray this morning you would help us to be bold enough to stand and do what you're calling us to do. And if we've been bold and standing and doing, let this be an encouragement and remind us that you said to him that thank you, stand, take heed, lest he fall, that we not get arrogant in that, but that we realize it is so easy to tumble down a hill of embarrassment and failure because we get to thinking we're something that we're not. So, Father, help us to move into liberty with you, to live the way you decided for us to live, and enjoy the freedom and the and, and, and the blessings that come from that. And, Father, if there's one who has not trusted Christ, please let them understand without Jesus they can't see heaven. They must trust Christ. If they have any hope for forgiveness, any hope for eternity with you, it only comes in trusting your Son. Give us what we need in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.